Louis Braille, the man who created an alphabet for the blind. I became blind when I was a child. There were very few books for people who couldn't see. It was very difficult for us to learn how to read and write. We needed an easy system. Could I invent one? When I was a child, I was curious, like most boys. My father had a workshop and made harnesses for horses. He had a lot of tools that I was interested in. One day, I picked up an awl, a very sharp tool, from my father's table, and I started playing with it. Suddenly, I tripped and fell. The awl hurt my eye badly. The doctor tried to help me, but my eye became infected. Soon, my other eye became infected too. I was five years old when I couldn't see the sun, the fields, or the blue sky any more. We lived in Coupray, a small town east of Paris. At school, I couldn't run or play with the other boys. It was difficult to learn because I couldn't read or write. My teacher and the local priest tried hard to teach me, but I didn't make much progress. I was slower than the other children in the class. My parents were very worried about my future. They didn't want me to become a beggar. They wanted me to study. One day, my father heard of Cannesvin, a school for blind people in Paris, and decided to take me there. I was ten years old and full of hope when I arrived at the school. Do you have books for a blind person? was my first question to Dr. Gill, the doctor in charge of the school. I was pleased to hear that they had. This is the right place for me, I thought. But soon I found out that life at Cannesvin was very hard. The school wasn't a pleasant place. The building was 500 years old, and the rooms were cold and damp, and Dr. Giel wasn't a pleasant man. He was a cruel man who hit his students and used very unkind words to describe blind people. I was very upset. At Cannesvin, students weren't taught how to read or write. Dr. Giel wasn't interested in that. We were taught how to make baskets, chairs, and slippers. For Dr. Giel, we weren't students. We were workers. He sold the beautiful things that we made. I was sad, lonely, and a long way from home. My parents didn't know that my life was so hard. Although the school was bad, it was the only place that had books for blind people. The books were large, heavy, and expensive. The letters were raised from the page, and I felt them with my fingers. The problem was that I took a very long time to read each word. When I got to the end of the sentence, I couldn't remember the beginning. But I wanted to read. There were fourteen books in the school, and I decided to read them all. Things got better when, in 1821, Dr. Pinier became the director of the school. We started to have music lessons. I loved to play music, and it became my favourite hobby. It was much easier than reading because I didn't need to read music. I could play by ear. I was asked to play at many churches in Paris. It was good to be outside the school. People said nice things to me. I was paid for my work, and I had my own money for the first time in my life. This meant a lot to me. When I was twelve years old, Charles Barbier, who worked for the army, visited our school. He told us about the system that his army used to read in the dark. They couldn't use light because the enemy might see them, so they used a system with twelve dots and dashes. The system was difficult, but it gave me an idea. 
When I returned home for a holiday, I started working on my idea. I went to my father's workshop and picked up an awl, the tool that hurt my eye, to invent a new system for reading and writing. I used the awl to raise dots on a page. Barbier's system had twelve symbols. My system was easier. It had only six. In 1824, I was 15 years old and I had a basic system. Five years later, the first book was published. It was called Method of Writing Words and Music and Plain Songs by Means of Dots for Use by the Blind and Arranged for Them. The system was called the Braille system. I was very happy with my system, but most teachers didn't want to use it. They weren't blind, and they didn't need it. They preferred the old system, with raised letters, because they didn't want to learn something new. But I continued to use it, and started to teach people to use it. In 1834, it was shown at an exhibition in Paris. I became a teacher at my old school. My students made progress quickly, and this made me very happy. But I was ill, and I began to feel very weak. The damp conditions in the school weren't good for my health. <coughs> the doctor said that I had tuberculosis, and in 1844 I had to stop teaching. But my students continued to use my system, and then Little by little, the system spread to other schools and other parts of the world. It became the reading and writing system for the blind. My students kept the Braille system alive. Alexander Graham Bell, the man who invented the telephone. I was always interested in sounds. My mother was deaf and my father taught deaf people. I was creative and enjoyed inventing things. I did a lot of experiments and one day I invented the telephone. I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. When I was a child I liked to learn new things. I liked art, poems and music and I could play the piano very well. I invented my first machine when I was 12 years old. I had a friend and his father had a mill. One day we were playing together in the mill when my friend's father told us, Why don't you do something useful? That's a good idea, I thought and I invented a new machine. My friend's father was very surprised. The machine could separate the outside parts of wheat grains from the inside parts. The machine could do the job quickly and easily. I left school when I was 15 years old because I wasn't interested in school lessons. My father was worried about my decision because he thought education was very important. He was a professor at Edinburgh University and worked on visible speech, a system to teach deaf people. I was interested in my father's work, maybe because my mother was deaf. One day I read a book that gave me an idea that it was possible to use electricity to produce sound. I decided to work on that. But hard times came. Between 1867 and 1870, two of my brothers became ill with tuberculosis and died. I also became ill, and I was very weak. My father thought that our family needed a new start, and one day he made a decision. We're going to move to Canada, he said. 
I was 23 years old when we sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. When we were there, my father bought a farmhouse in Ontario. Life on the farm was good for my health, and it helped me feel stronger. In Ontario, I met the Indians from the Six Nations Reserve, learnt their language, and used my father's system to help the deaf people in their community. They were so happy that they named me Honorary Chief. To celebrate, I put on their clothes and danced. It was great fun. In 1871, my father and I started teaching deaf people in Montreal. My father was such a good teacher that he received an invitation to work in Boston in the USA. We travelled there and opened a school to train teachers of the deaf. Suddenly, my life became very busy. I spent six months in Boston and the rest at home in Ontario. I started my research on sounds and electricity. I did most of my research on my own at night and I was so tired that I often had terrible headaches. In 1875, when Thomas Watson became my assistant, I finally got some help. One day, I met a man who was very important in my life. His name was Antonio Meucci. He showed me his invention, a basic telephone with one line to carry signals. His invention gave me an idea. Soon I started doing experiments to invent a telephone with more than one line. On the 2nd of June, 1875, my telephone worked for the first time. I was at one end of the line in one room, and Watson was at the other end of the line in another room. Watson, come here. I want to see you. And Watson came to see me. This was the start of a revolution that changed the world. I got a patent for my telephone. It was patent number 174,465. After that, I decided to work hard on my new invention. I didn't have much time to work as a teacher, so I only had two students, and one of them was Mabel Hubbard. Mabel was deaf, but she could read your lips and speak, and she later became my wife. Her father was a friend of mine. Mr. Hubbard was interested in my work and gave me money for my experiments. With his help, I invented a new telephone that could send messages more than five miles. I offered it to the company Western Union, but their president said it was a toy. The American government said, this telephone isn't useful and it will be dangerous in people's homes. I decided to start my own company without help from businessmen or the government. In 1877, I started the Bell Telephone Company with Mr. Hubbard. In 1881, I started the Volta Laboratory in Washington and invented many useful things. In 1885, I started a new company. I had a very busy life. I was a successful inventor and businessman. Thomas Edison, the man who invented the electric light bulb. One day, I was poor. The next, I was rich. I brought light to cities and invented lots of new things. How did I do it? I worked hard. But I also had good luck. I met the right people at the right time.
I was born in the United States. I went to school for only three months because my teacher thought that I caused trouble in the classroom. In fact, I spoke in a loud voice because I couldn't hear very well. When I left school, I was only seven years old. My mother became my teacher at home. My parents had seven children, and I was the youngest. We didn't have much money, so when I was twelve years old, all my brothers and sisters worked. I decided to work too. I got a job on the railways, and I sold food and drinks on trains. One day, I was at Mount Clemens Station when I saw a little boy on the railway. There was a train coming, and I ran to save him. The boy was the station master's three-year-old son. He wanted to thank me for saving his son, and taught me how to use the telegraph. I could get a better job now. From 1863 to 1867, I worked as a telegraph operator. I liked machines, and I sometimes did experiments. When I was 19, I had a job at the Western Union Company in Louisville. One day, I was trying an experiment when I spilled acid in the office and lost my job. I moved to Boston and invented a machine to record votes. No one was interested in it. So, when I was 22 years old, I decided to go to New York to make a new start. I knew one person in New York, so I went to see him. I haven't got a job, and I need some money. Could I borrow some from you? I asked. He was surprised. I can only lend you a dollar, he said. I took the dollar and promised to give it back. This dollar changed my life. I was hungry and weak, so I used the dollar to buy a meal. I felt much stronger after my meal, and I went out to look for a job. I talked to a few people. One of them was Franklin Pope. He worked for the Gold Indicator Company, and he showed me the company's building. I stayed in the battery room that night. The next day, I studied the company's machines. The third day was my lucky day. There was a machine that sent important information to the gold exchange. Suddenly, it stopped working. The people in the company didn't know what to do, but I knew what to do. I repaired the machine. Doctor Samuel Laws from the Gold Exchange heard of my work. He offered to pay me three hundred dollars a month to repair their machines. I was able to pay the dollar back. Soon, the president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company also heard of my work. Can you repair the machines in our company? He asked me. Three thousand dollars or five thousand dollars a year was good pay for the job, but he offered me forty thousand dollars. I was lucky once again. This was the start of my career as a businessman and inventor. I moved to New Jersey, and I opened several telegraph companies with Franklin Pope. In 1870, Mary Stillwell got a job in one of my companies. We got married the next year and had three children. I was happy to have a family, but I didn't have much time to be at home. I had a lot of ideas for new inventions. In 1876, 
I built a research laboratory at Menlo Park, formed a team, and invented the phonograph, a machine to play music, and many other things. My most important invention came next. Every day when the sun set, everything was dark. We had electricity, but we had no electric light. After a lot of experiments and hours of hard work at the laboratory, we invented the electric light bulb, the round glass object that produces light. In 1882, I helped to put 400 lights in the streets of Manhattan. New York got a new name, the city that never sleeps. I brought light to homes, hospitals, offices, factories, and schools. It was the beginning of the 24-7 lifestyle, 24 hours of light, seven days a week. Then a sad day arrived in my life. In 1884, my wife became ill and died. But two years later, I got married to Mina Miller and had three children. At work, it was a time of success. I started more companies and invented more things. I got one patent every 10 days. There were 1,093 in total. Then hard times came again. In 1913, a big fire destroyed 13 of our buildings. The next year, the First World War started in Europe. The government asked me to work on inventions to find guns and submarines. I couldn't work on my inventions anymore. During my life, I started a lot of companies and invented many things. One day, I was asked, how did you do it? My answer was, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Hard work was the key. Guglielmo Marconi, the man who invented the wireless system. I invented the radio and sent the first wireless messages across the Atlantic. My invention changed the speed of communication. I also invented radar systems. They tell us the speed, position and direction of objects which we can't see. I was born in Italy. My mother was Irish and my father was Italian. When I was a child, I learnt two languages, English and Italian. I could communicate with people in two different ways. Communication was very important in my life. When I was young, it wasn't easy to communicate with other countries. A few people used the telegraph. This machine sent electric signals through a wire between two places. I asked myself, is there a better way to communicate? Can one person hear another person at a distance without using a wire? Can voice messages travel from one city to another? I wanted to find answers to my questions, so I started doing experiments. I didn't attend university. I worked at home with very simple equipment, and my father helped me. In 1895, I was able to send radio waves over a distance of 100 meters. I was very excited. But some scientists told me, it's only possible to send waves in straight lines. They also said, it isn't possible if there is an object between the two places. I didn't agree, 
and I decided to try a new experiment. I built a receiving station behind a hill and asked my assistant, Mr. Mignani, to stay behind the hill. I gave him a gun and said, I'll send you a message from home. Fire this gun if you can hear me. I went to my father's house and sent him the message. Suddenly, I heard a very loud sound. It was Mignani's gun. My discovery was very important because it was the first wireless radio message in history. I needed money for my research, but in Italy no one was interested in my invention. I travelled to England in 1896 and showed my radio to William Priest from the British Post Office. He was interested in my work and decided to help me. He gave me money and I did many more experiments. Soon I was able to send messages over longer distances. My invention was now ready to use. The next year I got a patent for wireless telegraphy and started the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company. More and more people from business and government showed interest in my work and my life became busier and busier. In 1898 I opened the first radio factory in England with the help of some investors. In 1899 radio communication between England and France became possible. My company was growing fast and we needed more people to work in the factory. As a result, a new training college was opened in 1901. It was an exciting time. My next question was, can radio waves cross the Atlantic? That's too far away, many scientists said. Once again, I thought they were wrong, so I tried a new experiment. I sailed across the Atlantic to Newfoundland in Canada. When I was there, I put antennae on kites. The kites went high in the sky and helped to receive radio waves. On the 12th of December 1901, I got a message from Poldu in England, about 2,500 miles away. On that day, the world became smaller. The speed of communication did not depend on winds and ocean waves anymore. It now depended on radio waves. I was very lucky when I met Beatrice O'Brien. We got married on the 16th of March 1905 and we had three daughters and a son. It was a busy time. I was invited to Canada and Russia and received a lot of honours. In 1909, I received the Nobel Prize for Physics, which I shared with Carl Brown. In the same year, two ships, the SS Republic and the SS Florida, collided in the North Atlantic Ocean. Rescuers received radio messages and saved 4,000 people from the ships. Three years later, 712 survivors of the RMS Titanic were saved because of wireless technology. My radio system helped to save lives. Soon, everyone thought that my invention was very important. Communication did not depend on undersea wires or landlines any longer. My radio made communication much easier. Radio was useful for business, 
politics and wars, and I continued to work hard. But sadly, the First World War started in 1914. Communication became so important that the British government took control of my company. I couldn't run my business or do research, so I decided to return to Italy. I joined the army and was responsible for the army's radio service. They were sad times. A lot of people died. After the war, I returned to England because there was more opportunity to do business there. But I had to spend a lot of time in meetings. There was a strong connection between technology, power and business. And important people in business and government wanted to talk to me. I couldn't spend much time with my family. Our marriage ended in 1924. I was very happy when, some years later, I met Maria Cristina Betsiscali. We got married on the 15th of June 1927 and had a daughter three years later. I had a family again. During times of peace, I found more uses for wireless technology. People had radios in their homes. Ships used special radio waves. But my most important invention of the time was a new radio detection and ranging system. It was called radar. Its waves could tell us the speed of objects. They could also tell us the exact position of planes and ships. I sold radar systems to different companies and governments around the world. When I became ill, I decided to return to Italy. I wanted to spend the last years of my life in my country. I died in Rome in 1937. I made an important contribution to the world. I hope scientists will continue to develop wireless technology. I hope they will use it for the benefit of everyone. John Logie Baird the man who invented the television. I had an illness when I was a child and I had to live a quiet life. Technology became my hobby. We could send voice messages. Could I invent a system for sending pictures? I decided to try to do it. I had a serious illness when I was two years old and I couldn't do sport. I began to play with technical things. I had a friend who lived across the road and I built a phone that connected his home with mine. We sent messages to each other and had great fun. I was 12 years old at the time. At school, I wasn't a very good student. He doesn't learn very quickly, my teacher told my mother. But I worked hard and finished school. Then I entered university to study electrical engineering, but I couldn't finish my studies because the First World War started. My health was poor, so I didn't fight during the war. I worked as an engineer at Clyde Valley Electricity in Glasgow. My job was to repair the machines there, but I wasn't interested in repairing things. I was interested in making them. I enjoyed doing experiments. One day, one of my experiments went wrong and the lights went out in some parts of Glasgow. I lost my job. I decided to try a new place and a new way of life. In 1919 I travelled to the island of Trinidad in the West Indies. 
Life was quiet on the island. The weather was so sunny that I felt much better there. I started new experiments with sounds and pictures. My neighbors heard strange noises in my house. They also saw lights that turned on and off. He's doing some kind of magic, they thought. The local people were afraid of me. After a year on the island, I decided that Trinidad wasn't the best place for my experiments, and I sailed back to England. I asked myself, we have cameras to take pictures, we have radios to send messages. Is it also possible to send pictures? I wanted to invent a system for sending images from one place to another, and I started to work on my system. My first invention was a basic machine. I did more experiments, and on the 2nd of October 1925, I showed my television in Selfridges, a large store in London. It was the first public presentation of my experiment. In 1927, I started a company, Baird Television Limited. I also got a patent for my invention and sent television images over 438 miles. It was a very exciting time. I borrowed some money and did more experiments. My television became better each day. In 1930, people could watch the first play on television. Next year, they could watch a horse race, the Derby. I did many things in a short period of time. But I also had a big debt. My company sold 10,000 televisions in the UK, but I needed to sell more televisions. I wanted to pay off my debt. In 1931, I received an invitation to visit the USA. I sailed there with my girlfriend and future wife, Margaret Albu. I knew that I could sell a lot of televisions in the USA, but there was a depression at the time. In the UK, the situation wasn't any better. In 1936, the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, didn't choose my system to send television programmes. Then the Second World War started in 1939. It was a very difficult time for my company. During the war, London wasn't a safe place to live, so I moved my family to Cornwall. I stayed in London because I had to work for the government. I had to help with the use of radar systems and secret codes and messages. There were many difficult days during the war and I made several long journeys to visit my family. After the war, I decided to make a new start. I started a new company. John Logie Baird Limited and worked very long hours. I wanted to invent color television. But my health wasn't good. And in 1946, I had a heart attack and I never recovered. The television was a very important invention that changed education and entertainment. It changed people's lives. A lot of people use my invention. Think about the number of people around the world who watch television every day. <laughs>